customs here tonight. The, uh, the lady who was in charge, who was asking the questions, asked me, are you going to leave anything in Montreal? <laughs> so I told her, I mean, my initial reaction was, no, I'm not going to leave anything here. Uh, but then as I was walking away, I thought to myself, uh, that's not really true. I hope I am going to leave something here tonight. Um, I hope I hope I'm going to leave you at least with something to think about. Um, the topic for my drusha tonight is called um, the Golden Golas. Are we are we really waiting for Mashiach? And the question that perhaps is bothering you or it's going through your mind is um, why now? Is this the appropriate time of year? to speak about Mashiach. Perhaps this would be an, a more an appropriate drusha during the three weeks, perhaps before Yomim Neiroim. But why now? Why now do we, should we start thinking about are we really waiting for Mashiach? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But um, I, I think that's an important question, and I think that this is a question that all of us um, have to prepare for. Because Chazal tell us that Lachar Me'ev after we leave this world, we are going to have a Bechina. We're going to take a test. And that is going to be perhaps appropriately called, it's going to be the final, the final final. And on that Bechina, we are going to be asked four questions. A very simple final. A very short final. The Yomor in Shabbos on Daf Lamed Aleph and Aleph tells us, "B'shoshem achnisi nodem ledin." After a person leaves this world and he's brought into the din, he has to face the final judgment. They ask him the following things: "Oyemimloi nososo v'nasata be'amuna." They ask him, "Did you?" Conduct your business affairs honestly. Kavata itim lataira. Then you set aside every day time to learn. And if you're a woman, I assume that that question means, did you help your husband put time away every single day to learn? The third question is, Asakta Bipiri of Arivia. Did you engage in trying to have children? Not necessarily did you have children, because as we know, that is not always up to us. But Asakta Bipiri of Arabia, did you try at least to have children? And the final question is, the peace of Yeshua. Did you anxiously await the coming of the Mashiach? Now we know we've been preparing ourselves for the other three questions. There have been enough schmoozing and enough, enough talks given and enough sessions at uh, good at conventions and the like devoted to the question of business ethics. And we certainly over the last few years, and I think this is a major chain in, change in Yiddishkeit throughout North America and the world, we have all become more Zahir and Kviyas Itim Lataira. There's a lot more learning going on than there was 25, 30 years ago. Daf Yaimis, Daila Dafs, Daila Shears. Today it's relatively easy to be Kviyas Itim Lataira. We all know as Jews the importance of having children and raising those children. We know that that is a question that should be on that final Bechina. But why Tzipisali Yeshua? Why is that so vital a question that it makes that final exam, of which there are only three other questions? And what we obviously see from this is that all of those questions have to do with how we live our daily lives. 
That's why they're there. Because that has to do, not only was, did I eat matzah on Pesach? Or did I listen to the Shafer on Rosh Hashanah? But these are questions that goes to the essence of what my daily life is about. Was I honest in business? Because that affects our daily life. Was I kevetim l'tayra that I learn every day? That also affects our daily lives. Asakta b'piria v'rivya. Did we have and try to raise those children? Anyone who's a parent knows that's something that, that we have to deal with every single waking moment. And by inclusion, the Pisol Yeshua tells us that that has to be something that we have to think about on a daily basis. That means that when we get up in the morning and we brush our teeth and we look in the mirror, we have to say to ourselves, well, maybe today's the day. And as the day goes by, and it's already one o'clock, we say, have to say to ourselves, it's already 12 o'clock, and he's not here yet. And when we go to bed at night, we have to say to ourselves, another day, and he didn't come. This concept of Tzipiso Li Yeshua tells us and demands from us that we have to have a sense of inadequacy about our lives. That we have to be mitzvah, that we have to anxiously and eagerly await His coming. That I feel that my day and my life is incomplete. That's what that question is about. They are going to ask us, did you feel an inadequacy in your life? Were you impatient? Could you not wait for the moment? And we know what it means to be impatient in other areas of life. In Baltimore, we used to have two kosher supermarkets. Fav and Isenu Harabim. One of them closed. And now we only have one. And it seems that every year of Yontif and every year of Shabbos, everybody gets the same idea that it's time to go shopping. <laughs> and people stand there in line with steam coming out of their ears. So a woman once remarked, and this was not a woman who's trying to say or to show how from she was. If people would only wait for Mashiach, the way they wait for that checker counter girl to get this line over with. That's what it means to be impatient. For many years, my wife and I and family lived in an apartment on Yeshiva Lane, on the campus of the Yeshiva. And as we got older, and our family got older and bigger, we felt the need that it's time to move to bigger quarters. And the yeshiva went ahead and built townhouses for the Rabbeim. And if you have ever had anything to do with new construction, you know what it is, the process that it takes from beginning till end. They broke ground after Pesach and they told us we will be in by Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> Rosh Hashanah came and it was nowhere near finished. They said, don't worry, you'll be in by Hanukkah. You will light Hanukkah licht in your new house. And then the ground got cold and a water main broke and this thing happened and the winter went by and finally two weeks before Pesach we moved into our house. So 
come and remarked and said, Now you know what it means. Yeshua. <clears throat> now what it, you know what it means to anxiously await what you deem the Yeshua. But unfortunately for me, this was not the coming of the Mashiach that we anticipated. It was merely moving into a bigger home. That's what it means to see peace of Yeshua. To feel inadequate. A couple months ago, there was a another break, so to speak, in the hostage crisis. And I was listening to a wife of a hostage and she made the following statement and it made such an impact on me I wrote it down she said I haven't gone to bed once in the last six years not thinking that tonight could be the night that's what it means to see peacefully Yeshua And that's what that question is going to be about. And that's the test that we have to answer. Did we feel our lives to be inadequate? Historically speaking, I do not think the Jews of years gone by had problems with this. I think that in past generations... He even knew what it meant to be Tzipisli Yeshua. He even dreamt of the Geula. When one was under the oppression of the Polish landlord or the Russian Tsar or in Spain during the Inquisition, he even knew what it meant to be Tzipisli Yeshua. This is a unique Nisoyan for our generation. Because whether you live in Canada or whether you live in the United States, we are Zecha Baruch Hashem, Bachazde Hashem, to live in a Malchus Shal Chesed. We live in times that we can practice our Yiddishkeit. We are free to do what we want and to go what we want. There's literally nothing that stands today in the way of the Jew and even the Orthodox Jew. So therefore it is an Isoyan for us. It was not an Isoyan for Polish Jewry and it wasn't an Isoyan for Russian Jewry, but it is an Isoyan for North American Jewry. It's an Isoyan that here we are in the comfort of North America, in the affluence of North America, in this wonderful country, and we still have to be Metzapeli Yeshua. <coughs> and in fact, Rav Dessler says in the fourth Chalik of Michtav Me'eliyahu, that it is no coincidence that in the time prior to the Mashiach, the Rebbeinu Shalom knows that we cannot be preoccupied and worried about putting bread on the table, that we can't pre be preoccupied about whether we're going to live or whether we're going to die, whether we're going to be exterminated. We need that peace of mind, that Yishuv Adas, that Menuchas HaNefesh, to prepare spiritually for the Mashiach. And that's why we have this tremendous situation that we have here. Because we're supposed to use this opportunity to prepare, to think about ruchnius, to think, think about spirituality. But instead, this tremendous matana that the Rebbeinish Loilam has afforded us has distracted us. And rather than using this affluence and this bracha and this freedom to prepare, we've wasted or we're wasting the opportunity. The Shalom writes in the end of Mesech the Sukkah, Ro'oi Ro'isi B'nai Yisrael, I see Jews, the Shalom lived in Europe. Batim Kamo Hasarim. People who erect palaces that are fit for kings and queens. Oisim der diras keva ba'ilam hazeh uveeretz hatuma. 
They sink down roots in this country as though they were going to be here for time immemorial. Kavanosam he lived like Leis Lem Nachlo Lahanchal Libneem Ulvne Beneem. They think that they're going to head and give this over to their children and their grandchildren. The Zenira the Shalla writes Chas Visholom Kehesa Hadas Min Hagaula. If you become so entrenched, if you become so comfortable that you think that this is my mama land and my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren are going to live here and you take this affluence and you take this bracha and you take this freedom and you think that this is where I belong that's kehesa hadas min hakaula that's not anxiously awaiting the Mashiach that's thinking what am I going to do if he's going to come? What's going to be with my swimming pool? We unfortunately, whether we're willing to admit it or not, but we feel perhaps like a 12th grader who when his Rebbe told him over this Gemara of Tzipisali Yeshua, that you have to anxiously await the Mashiach, his remark was, Rebbe, if you tell me it's a mitzvah to want the Mashiach, then I'll want him. But I really don't need the Mashiach. I'm learning great. I'm steiging. Why do I need the Mashiach? And that's unfortunately how many of us may feel. It's great. It's Kishmak. We have our families. We're Ehrlich. We're from. The Yishkat is tremendous. We can do what we want. Who needs Mashiach? But we're not 12th graders anymore. We're adults. And we're not going to articulate that because we're embarrassed but how many of us really feel like that how many of us really feel this inadequacy because if we felt this inadequacy then we would want him we would be like another boy a case a, 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 an example of two boys at the other end of the spectrum one boy who says, Rebbe, I'm learning terrific, I don't really need the Mashiach. And another boy who was in a summer camp in the mountains. And whose Rebbe, who was learning Rebbe for that summer, could not reach him. He could not get to him. He was kind and it didn't help. He was soft and it didn't help. He was strict and it didn't help. Nothing helped. The kid sat there and spaced out the entire summer. <laughs> until one time the Rebbe learned the Gemara of Mehera Yibane Beis Hamigdash where the Gemara mentions the concept the next year perhaps the Beis Hamigdash will be built and all of a sudden a light goes off over that boy's head and he says to him Rebbe you really mean that, that the, Mas the Beis Hamigdash can be built and the Mashiach is going to come next year the Rebbe says yeah it could happen. And the learning Rebbe didn't know what chord he struck. So he went to the director of the camp and he said, what is it with this boy? For the last six weeks, he doesn't doesn't even care about anything. And all of a sudden, he's interested in Meheira Yibonebes Amigdosh. He says, you don't understand that the camp director told him. This boy is a yosem. He has no father and he has no mother. And he knows that when the Mashiach will come, there'll be Tchias Hanesim. So he feels inadequate. He needs the Mashiach. Because he needs his parents. And that's the difference. That's the difference. The one boy 
his life is secure and fine and everything's in place doesn't sense doesn't have that sense of inadequacy but the, the boy who who is chaser he wants the Mashiach so now the question is how do we how do we engender in ourselves that sense of inadequacy what do we do how do we hear in a city like this in a community like this how do we begin to feel this chisarin that will make us think more about the Mashiach and ideally speaking if we were all really really Avde Hashem servants of the Rebbe Shalom and we were real, real, really Ehrlich of people, this would also not be a challenge. Because we, as Abde Hashem, as true servants of the Rebbe Shalom, would feel, how could we go on with our lives if the Rebbe Shalom, our master, is hidden from us? How could we put up with this concept which the Swarm referred to as Shinta Begalusa? The Shin is in Gullis. We get up every Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and we say, Reveal yourself. Show the world that you're the king. <coughs> if, we're really, if we really were true servants, oh, how we would long for Mashiach. But most of us are not on that Madrega. Unfortunately, I can't get up here. I can't even tell myself, let alone you. Oh, the Melech is covered. The scene is in Gullis. How inadequate our lives are. Rabbi Schwab, Solagazut and Starkzheim, once gave a beautiful marshal to what kind of situation we're in. You go to a chasana, it's a beautiful hall, everybody is dressed up well, everybody is there, the band is playing, the photographers are snapping their pictures away, people are enjoying themselves at the wonderful smorgasbord, everything is beautiful, except there's no kala. The kala isn't showing. So what is that? Is that a beautiful wedding? Narvas, it's okay, a small technical problem. <laughs> or is that a chasana on a kala? A wedding without a kala is garnished. We're in a chasana without a kala. Everything is beautiful. The band, the photographer, the food, the outfits, everything is beautiful. So we don't miss the kala. But again, that doesn't appeal to most people. We don't feel like the kala is missing. So what do we do? How do we talk ourselves into the fact that we are very chaser, that we are very inadequate, that we really need the Mashiach. The one thing that we can think about, and it's not a very pleasant thought, is that as Jews, we can never take our existence anywhere in the Gullus as a given. And if you doubt that for a minute, I have 3,000 years of Jewish history to back me up. As long as a Jew is in Gullus, nothing ever is for sure. There's an interesting Gemara in Baba Basra. This is the type of Gemara that when you read it, or you hear it, it seems to make no sense at all. And you just 
dismiss it as just another agarata, which we really can't understand. The Gemara says in Baba Basra, Baba Rabba Bar Barchana, Zim Nochada Hava Kaz Linan Bisvinasa. Rabba Bar Barchana says at one time they were going on a boat. Vachazina Kavra de Yosiv Lechalsa Agabe. And we saw this tremendous fish, a whale. It was so enormous that sand had collected on the whale's back to such an extent that we thought it was an island. V'kodach agma iluya Savrinon, it was so enormous Savrinon yabeshtahi We were sure that this wasn't the back of a whale but this was dry land. We had reached an island. Visalkinon, and we got off the boat. Vaafinon, Ubashlinon, Agabe, and we cooked and we baked on the back of what we thought was an island, but indeed was only a fish. The Karchom Gabe is Hapich. But when it got too hot for the whale, from the heat of the cooking, the whale turned over. The ilav, the hava, the karva, svinasa, hava tavina. And had the boat not been nearby, we all would have drowned. Now you read such a Gemara and you think, what's he talking about? an island on the back of a whale. They really thought it was dry land. So the Marsha says that they're talking about the Yiddish Golis. We were in a sea called Golis. And we got off the boat and we landed on different lands. Whether it was Spain or whether it was Greece, or whether it was Poland, where Jews lived for a thousand years, or whether it was Russia. And we thought, Yabeshtahi. We thought, this is it. We're here forever. We're on dry, secure land. Vahava Afinon, Vahava Bashlinon. And we put down roots, and we raised families, and we had, and we lived such a wonderful life. The Karchom Gabe. But when it got too, uh, too hot for the whale, the whale turned over and said, no more juice. In 1492, Spain. 1648, Kiev. 1940, Germany and Poland. Take your pick. We thought that we were on dry land. So what do we tell ourselves? And hopefully it's true, never here. Not in North America. Not in the United States, and certainly not in Canada. Not here. Can't happen here. And then something happens in Crown Heights in Brooklyn, and you see how racial tensions can erupt. You're probably not aware of this, but in America today, if you say the name David Duke, Everybody knows who you're talking about. <laughs> David Duke went and is now in a runoff election to become the governor of the state of Louisiana. David Duke is a former member of the American Nazi Party and a former Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan who, 
claims he's done tshuva and he's no longer a racist. In the United States of America on November 16th, David Duke perhaps could become Chas Shalom, the governor of Louisiana. This last summer, we were in Toronto for our vacation. So my wife and I took a gray line sightseeing tour of the city. And in back of us were two elderly gentlemen, Englishmen, with wonderful English accents, had no idea, could not dream that they were Jewish. Anyway, we stopped at a park, and thank you, and we got off, and I figure I'll walk over to these guys and ask them, what do they think of Toronto? They seem like such nice English gentlemen. So I walk over to the fellow and i about to say hello. And he says, Shalom Aleichem. I said, how did you know? I wasn't wearing a black suit and a white shirt and a tie. I was wearing a little cap and don't tell anybody, a polo shirt. So he pulled my beard and he says, of course I knew. We sat there the whole time, he tells me, trying to figure out whether your, was your wife's real hair or was only a shaito. <laughs> and these were Jews, totally alienated Jews, reformed Jews from Manchester, England. And he says to me, a lot of anti-Semitism in Baltimore. <laughs> and I didn't know what he meant. There's no anti-Semitism in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. But then I tried, I figured out what this guy was talking about. A couple weeks later, a former Talmud of mine who was doing an exchange program with a university in, in Manchester tells me you can't imagine the anti-Semitism that you feel just below the surface in Europe. <laughs> that you go to Belgium and to Italy and of course to France and you feel it. Mm -hmm. We don't feel that here. But it's an illusion. And the Rebbe Shalom should be Shemar Matzil and the whale should never turn over. But we can't take it for granted. And slogans like never again, they don't mean anything. Well, my wine makes a very incisive comment. American Indians don't have a slogan, never again. They don't have to worry. It's never gonna happen to them again. If you have to keep on telling yourself never again, it could be again. But I still don't want to say that that's the only reason to want Mashiach. I'm not here to scare you. I don't want to employ scare tactics. But I think that more fundamentally, we need Mashiach because our lives are indeed adequate. Because we live in a situation called Golis. And Golis means that the Rebbeinu Shalaylam is behester Panim. Which means he's behind a cloud. And we live in effect, in a fog. And we really, so many times, don't know what's going on with us. And it all may, all may be fine and good when life is going along swimmingly, and we don't have to deal with tsaris, 
and we don't have any questions, then we're fine. But how many times have all of us had the situation that we want to know why? Why is this happening? Why are there tragedies? Why are there tsars? Why are young people killed in car accidents? And we go to the Hespadim and the Rabbonim tell us you have to do tshuva and as something like this happens to a community that means we have to introspect and we all want to know so but what should we do? And can anybody tell us this is what's wrong? No. Because we live the Hester pun. Because we live in a fog. And if the Rebbein Islam was Begoli and we wouldn't be in this Gullis, then we would go to the Navi and the Navi would tell us directly and unequivocally and specifically and tell us this is wrong and this is what you must do and this is the tshuva that this community needs there was no one to tell us and we can guess and we can speculate what we don't know and that's a horrible condition to be in. Never to know. What does he want from us? I gave this lecture two weeks ago tonight in a different city. And a woman, after hearing this lecture, writes me a letter. read you her letter last year at exactly this time we gave birth to a little girl we were delighted because she was our seventh child and especially she had several older bro brothers within hours of her birth we discovered that the right side of her heart was very small and she would require immediate open heart surgery. After three and a half months of struggling, our, da our daughter released her tenuous hold on life and went back to Hashem. Your words were particularly poignant for me because throughout our daughter's illness, we sought advice from various religious people. Some told us that this had happened because we were bad. Some breathed heavily and looked very sad. And one man said, as you did last night, that we had no way of truly knowing why, because Hashem was behind a cloud and we had no profit to ask for a definitive reason. Because of these difficult circumstances, I prayed daily for Mashiach to come with great fervor and honestly expected him hourly. Our tragedy, as you mentioned in your talk, made us very aware of our need for Mashiach. Life is fine and good. We're like that 12th grader. But that's not how life is. And we should be tired of living the Hester him. And we should want Mashiach so we can once and all for all know what should we do? What are we doing right? And what are we doing wrong? 
But there's another reason why we need Mashiach. We need Mashiach because Klal Yisrael today is in a horrible, horrible matzav. And it is hard for us in a community like this, here of A and B Yisrael, it is hard for us to feel that Klal Yisrael is in a terrible matzah. But it is. Let me read you some statistics from the 1990 National Jewish Population Study of the Federations, the United Federations of the United States. Since 1985, 52% of all marriages involving Jews have been interfaith. In 1964, only 9% were intermarried. Three quarters of the children of interfaith married are not related, are not raised as Jews. 41% are raised in other religions, usually Christian, and 31% with no religion at all. with that? Can we say Shalom Alay Navshi? As as long as I have my Chal of Yisrael and I have my Daladav and my kids are in Yeshivas and Beis Yaakov and my sons-in-laws are learning in, in Lakewood so Shalom Alay Navshi what's going on in Eretz Yisrael? Do we like that Sinas Hadas when we see policemen hitting clubs over people with Strymlach? And we say to ourselves, what's going to be? It's such an insoluble, intractable situation. This guy wants to drive on Shabbos. It's his only day off. He doesn't know it's Shabbos. This guy is Shib Shabbos. Kill Shabbos. How can you drive on Shabbos? This guy's hitting him over the head. This guy's hitting him over the head. Who's going to solve that? What's going to be? How can it go on? How can we be happy with that? There's a peace conference going on over now. Now. What's going to be? Everybody wants the same piece of land. There's no compromise. There's no easy way out of that. We're never going to give back Yerushalayim. They're never going to understand that we can't give back Yerushalayim. What's going to be? James Baker is going to solve this problem. solve the problem. There's only one person that's going to solve that problem. There's only one person that's going to solve all these problems. That's the Mashiach. So what do we say? Shalom alai nafshi. But I'm fine. By me, everything's all right. We don't care about Klal Yisrael. We talk about Klal Yisrael, be, Klal Yisrael being one body. That that's not just another Jew. That's my finger. That's us. That's, that's the community. That's my. That's my right arm. But that's lip service. We say it, but we don't mean it. Interesting Yareis Dvash. The Yareis Dvash from Rabbeinus and Ibshis. It's always bothered me, right? That when we drink, when we have a second bottle of wine, <coughs> so the halach is you have to make a bracha hatayv hametiv. You know what the source of the bracha of hatayv hametiv is? So the Chazal made a bracha 
Hatay v'hameti of Hatay v'shalay hisrichu v'hameti v'shenitnu l'kvura. That's the source of that bracha. So here I am. I'm at a festive occasion. I'm drinking wine with my friends. I am zeichet to have another bottle of wine. And what bracha do I make? Hatay v'hameti. And what am I supposed to think about? Haruge Beitar. Isn't that rather inappropriate? So the Tumim writes, because hey Nanshu, Pesomchu Bamapolas Yisrael, because the people of Beitar thought that they could go it alone. The people of Beitar thought, so what if Yushalayim is destroyed? We are all alright. I'm okay. The Samchu begat Luson. The way Chashashu will churban base Hamigdash. It didn't bother them, the churban of the bias, because we're all right. The Chain Anu Bishtias Yayin Yesh Lanu La Eirer Avain Betar. And that's precisely the point. When life is good, and you're enjoying another bottle of wine. Don't forget the rest of Klai Yisrael. Don't forget all those Yiddish ch- children now who don't know at Surah Salaf. Forget at Surah Salaf. I read recently in an article in Newsweek that these Yiddish children are more at home with sushi than they are with chicken soup. That's how far we've got. A generation ago, at least, they were gastronomic Jews. Today, they don't even have that. That's the second reason why we need Mashiach. And the third reason that I think we need Mashiach because I think we finally have to realize that we are living in a tomadika, morally depraved land. I don't know how it is in Canada, but in the United States today, it's just horrible. You cannot open up cannot open up a New York Times sometimes anymore not to be offended by the advertisements. That which would have only been in a pornographic magazine 15 years ago today is a legitimate advertisement in the New York Times. Again, this is an American experience. I don't know how much this affected you but in the United States a couple of months ago we went through the Thomas hearings Clarence Clarence Thomas as you I'm sure have heard of was a candidate for the Supreme Court there were congressional hearings and what was heard on national television and radio was something that 10 years ago was inconceivable that such things should be discussed in public. People were glued. <laughs> and so what do we do about that? How do we insulate ourselves from that influence? What do we do about our children? We are living, as the Shalwa wrote, the Eretz Hatuma. And it's getting more and more difficult to protect ourselves. This is becoming a hostile environment for a religious Jew. When we think of it in those terms, then we 
begin to think that maybe it's not all that great here. Maybe this is not the place for you to be. <clears throat> and that's why we need Mashiach. Because it's not as great as we think. And to a large extent, it depends on us. We can change it. We can bring him. I heard a very interesting comment once from Rabbi Pesach Krohn. And in the Brochus of Shemayna Esrei, we ask, for instance, for Slicha, for Tshuva, and we say, Ki Melech Meichel V'Saleach Because you are a God that gives forgiveness. We ask for Rafua and we say, Ki Kel Melech Reifei Neman V'Racham Because you are a God that heals. But when we come to the bracha of Mashiach, Esemach David Abducham Meheira Satzmiach, Please bring the Mashiach. Why? Ki lishu ascha kivinu kol hayam. Because we want him. It's not up to you. It's up to us. Ki lishu ascha kivinu kol hayam. So what's the terrors? If it's us to up, if it's up to us then why hasn't he come? The answer must be that we perhaps don't want him enough. When Rabbi Yisif Dave Halevi Salavechik, the famous Beis Halevi, became the Rav in Brisk, he was a Rav in a different town, and he retired from the Rabbonis, and he said he was never going back in Rabbonis again. So the Yidin of Bris came to the Beis Halevi and they they begged him that he should become the Rav in Brisk. And, Brisk, and he said, no, I gave up the Rabbonus, I'm not going to become a Rav again. So one of the Yidin from the delegation went to him and said, there are 20,000 Jews in Brisk waiting for you. How can you say no? The Beis Halevi said, you're right. 20,000 people waiting for me. Then I have to come. When the Chafetz Chaim heard the story, he cried. He says, if, the, if, the, if Rabbi Yisaf Soloveitchik feels compelled that there are 20,000 Jews waiting for him and he has to come, <laughs> so the Mashiach feel, should feel any less sensitive than the Beis Halevi? So there are 200,000 Jews waiting for him. There's 2 million Jews waiting for him. There's 11 million Jews waiting for him. Why isn't he coming? The answer is that he doesn't have 20,000 Jews waiting for him. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. You know, for thousands of years, unfortunately, We've always believed, we have to believe, that his coming is imminent. And even throughout all this time, I've always pointed to Simonim. The signs are here. There are some signs in our generation that are absolutely undeniable signs that we are living very close to the period of Mashiach. We know that one of the telltale signs of Mashiach will be Kibbutz Goliath. The ingathering of the exiles when Eden from all over the world will be brought back together. There has never been a period like this. The Eden from Iran that were there for 2,000 years are all of a sudden coming back. The Eden from Ethiopia who were there for 3,000 years are all of a sudden coming back. 
the heathen are coming out by the plane load from Russia. That's Kibbutz Goliath. That's an undeniable sign. And the Navi Malachi, the last Navi, told us what will be the Simon Muvok that Mashiach is about to come. The Navi Malachi writes, the very last Navi, the Heishi Levavai Salbonim, the Levbonim Alavaisam, that there will come a time in Jewish history the children will bring back the parents to Yiddishkeit. And there must have been thousands and thousands of Jews who learned that Pesach and could not understand what that meant. What does it mean that children will bring back parents? It's always been a struggle the other way. It's always been a struggle to, that the, the parents can try to keep the children. What does Beheshi Vleivav Esabonim mean? It means one and only one thing. It means the Balchuva movement. We are living at that time. We are living at the time that the Navi Malachi promised and told us, this is it. When you, say, when you see children bringing back parents, that's it. You know he's about to come. And I will end with a maisa of Vaheshi Vaivavis Abbanim. What it means for children, for a child to bring back parents. There is a woman at Balash Chuvan Eretz Yisrael that says, who is now from, who says, My daughter brought me back to Yiddishkeit. She was a woman, a Chilonis, totally secular, totally irreligious happened to move to, to near B'nai Brak. And the woman says on herself that she was a Pachtanis. She's a nervous person. And she didn't want her daughter traveling by bus to a secular school. There was a school, a religious school in B'nai Brak that she could walk to so against her better judgments, she sent her daughter to the religious school. And the god daughter became more and more religious until one Friday afternoon, the daughter says to the mother, I want to light Shabbos candles for Shabbos. And the mother says, not in my house. There'll be no Shabbos candles in my house. And the daughter cried and begged and she said, no, no way. The daughter went up to her room. It got close to Shabbos. Finally, the girl, little girl, runs out of her house, runs to a neighborhood grocer and says, I want to buy Shabbos candles. And the grocer knows, the storekeeper knows that this family, the last thing this family needs is Shabbos candles. It must be that they need Yorkshire candles. So she gives the girl two yardside candles. And the girl takes the yardside candles home and she goes up into her room thinking that these are Shabbos candles and she lights the yardside candles. And the parents are worried she's not coming down for supper. They go up to her room and there are burning two yardside licht. And the mother asked the daughter, what's this? And the daughter says, innocently, Echad bishvil ha'aba, the echad bishvil ha'ima. One for the father, and one for the mother. And when that mother saw her yardside candle burning, she became a Baal Shuba. That's what it means. The Heshiv Leif Avais. Albani. That, these are the times that we live in. Ikvesir Mashicha. Kibbutz Goliath. Bali Tshuva. 
imminent. The rest is up to us. If we really want him, if we are convinced of the inadequacy of our lives, then indeed he will come. This year was presented by Rav Yisachar Fran Shlita.